Thank you so much for joining us today. I'm Griffin Shea. I'm the Growth and Partnerships Director here at Open Supply Hub. Uh, our webinar today is Open Data Opens Doors, how we're building the world's most complete, open, accessible, and global supply chain map. Uh, for those of you that have joined us for previous webinars, uh, today will be a little bit more of big picture focused. So if you're looking for more of a how-to, uh, you're welcome to visit our website or visit our YouTube channel. Um, we did look at all the great questions that you all submitted when you registered. Um, we tried to incorporate as much as we possibly could, but if you feel like we didn't touch on something specific, uh, feel free to reach out to us afterwards. And then same goes for questions submitted via the Q&A or chat that we don't get to answer during the presentation. Uh, before we dive in, I want to let everyone know we'll be recording and sharing this along with the slides afterwards. Uh, so don't worry about taking notes. With me today is Natalie, our founder and CEO, uh, Hannah, our director of stakeholder engagement. Uh, Hannah is also primarily responsible for getting everyone together today. So thank you very much, Hannah. Uh, Bruna, our community manager in Brazil. Joe, business, our business development director and Francesca, our customer success manager. Uh, Francesca will also be addressing your questions throughout uh, via the Q&A in the chat. So our agenda today um, is really going to be the OS Hub vision and what we've done to achieve it, uh, inspiration for how you can use OS Hub, overcoming barriers to transparency, and then looking ahead, what's next in 2025 and beyond. Uh, so with that, I will kick it over to Natalie. Thank you, Griffin. Um, and thank you everyone so much for being with us today, um, for taking time out of your day uh, to learn more about Open Supply Hub. From food to phones, nearly everything we buy is connected to us by a global supply chain that stretches around the globe. And it links us with the people and places that create those products. Over time though, supply chains have become more complex and that's making it harder to know where products really come from. And this complexity is creating a lack of visibility and a lack of visibility often means that someone or some place is being exploited. To transform supply chains, we really need to see all the parts and understand what is happening, where and who is involved. And that means information needs to be open and shared, not locked away. And that often comes down to how we work with data. Data really does mirror real life. To enable unique insights and collaboration, information needs to be open and shared, not owned or monopolized. The way that we structure and share data affects the programs and the work that we can build from it. Data problems can become real world problems and vice versa. So to bring about systemic change, we must move from closed or exclusive to open and accessible, from siloed and incomplete to built collectively to help fill in the gaps, and from engaging those that we know to finding those best poised for impact. So without this shift, we won't be able to see the big picture and we won't be able to make supply chains safe and sustainable. And that is why we created Open Supply Hub. Open Supply Hub is powering the transition to safe and sustainable supply chains by building the world's most complete and open accessible map of global production. We're doing this collectively through open data sources, company disclosures, partnerships, and public contributions. And everyone really does have a role to play. Our shared platform makes it easy for anyone to see where things are made and who is connected to those locations. And with this open collective model, you can almost think of us as a Wikipedia of primary supply chain data. We're built collectively, we're used collectively, and we're maintained collectively. Now, as a 501c3 uh, nonprofit with a global multi-stakeholder board of directors, We've purposely established Open Supply Hub as a pre-competitive public good that everyone can contribute to and benefit from. We're funded through a combination of philanthropic support, donations from our users, and revenue from our premium service offerings. Now, three pillars make our model work. 
First, on the left, openness and accessibility. For the first time, there is a common place for anyone who's trying to improve supply chains to go. Instead of waiting through countless websites or we're still not having access to the information at all, um, we can all work together to build a collective data set. We can all get access to better data. Two, standardization and data exchange. Um, the biggest barriers that we face are data quality, different data formats, different unique IDs. It makes it impossible to connect, match, compare, and layer data sets. So we've built our platform on a human in the loop machine learning algorithm, which is trained to standardize and match as this data is coming in from various sources. So you get one location, all living under one universal interoperable ID. And then finally, engagement and impact. You can't collaborate with people that you don't know exist and you can't solve a problem that you can't see. So OS Hub is set up to help quickly figure out who is best poised to work with you and where overlaps are, um, enabling search for production in specific regions, specific facilities, or specific supply chains. So we really believe that when everyone builds and works from the same base data set together, countless opportunities can be unlocked. Anyone can share, discover, and collaborate with Open Supply Hub. And we'll get more into some of those examples later. So how are we doing in achieving this mission of collaboratively mapping global supply chains? Um, some updates for you. First of all, we are at nearly 1 million production locations mapped um, with, product, with contributions, excuse me, coming from over 1,400 organizations around the world. You can also see here that we've expanded from our roots um, in the apparel and footwear sector to now broader sectors captured here found on this slide. And I'll highlight quickly where we're seeing the most heat and concentration in terms of data contributed. Uh, it is not too early for me to know that those numbers at the bottom do add up to more than 100%, um, but we have some overlap in the facilities and the sectors that they touch. But you can see here, we've really grown our data set in agriculture, food and beverage, um, general merchandise and uh, electronics and renewables as well. On the next slide, you can see here that um, there's value for many different types of stakeholders. Thousands of stakeholders are making use of the different benefits and different organizations can see different benefits from Open Supply Hub. And this is just a snapshot. But to give you a sense, um, we have brand and retailers being able to find a reliable base for due diligence with industry organizations having unique IDs to enable interoperability for civil society, the ability to help speed up the remediation process when an issue is identified, and for manufacturing groups, visibility on global platforms. This is just a snapshot. Again, there's more here and we'll do a deeper dive, um, but really just demonstrating here the value to all different types of stakeholders in the global supply chain. Now, super quickly, I'd also like to spotlight a few collaborative efforts. In addition to working with these individual organizations I just mentioned, um, individual contribute contributors. There are also some bigger, more collaborative projects that have helped us grow this year that we really want to spotlight. <clears throat> First, um, we have our Global Supply Chain Data Exchange Standard, or um, short in short, SCDEX. The idea here is that with other supply chain partners, including civil society, service providers, brands and retailers, we identified the need for a common global language to exchange supply chain data in an easy accessible and open way. As new regulations, changing environmental conditions and shifting consumer values are changing the state of supply chain reporting, we need tools for interoperable data sharing. So the SCDEX is a machine readable data schema for publishing supply chain locations, specifying geographic coordinates and regions. And it also expresses the relationships between these locations and the organizational affiliations. Our goal is ultimately to invite everyone from a software engineer to a farmer collective in India to be able to participate and contribute to the growing global ecosystem of supply chain data in an easy, accessible way that ultimately facilitates data harmonization and interoperability. We have released our first draft standard, we formed a governance structure, and we're engaging with other protocols like UNTP to ensure alignment. So if you're interested in learning more about this, I know we just dropped a link into the chat, please check out the website, join the GitHub, and our Slack community. Next, we have grown our database and pushed into new sectors with um, our data sprints. 
These six-week internal uh, sprints help us consolidate and standardize existing public data. So stakeholder engagement has also helped to inform research and application of the data. And then finally, in instances where this is a sector that's new to transparency, it helps take the theoretical and make it tangible by showcasing the potential once this data is live on our site. Finally, um, we have been pleased to announce earlier this week that with partnerships with Ethical Supply Chain Program, Ethical Trade Initiative, Ethical Tea Partnership, and our friends at Cascale, um, more than 400 companies are participating, um, it, more than 400 companies participating in these initiatives, excuse me, are lined up to share data on Open Supply Hub. And these partnerships really demonstrate industry alignment and will help realize the potential of collective harmonized data for real collaboration and impact. And so um, I'd love to do a quick deep dive now into one of these collaborations with Andrew Martin, the Executive Vice President of Cascale. Andrew, thank you so much for being with us. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you, it's a privilege to be here. Thank you. Um, I'll dive in with a first question. Can you share a little bit about why transparency is top of mind for your members right now and why is it a critical part of your work at Cascale? No, absolutely, and thanks. It's a good question. I think um, I would start with the word necessity. So actually, transparency is becoming a necessity, and I think we are all aware, and you alluded it to earlier, about um, regulation and legislation and what that's driving. Um, I think that's the hard and the easy one to, to focus on first, and so that's put it front of mind for many people. I think as an organization for some of our members, maybe not all, um, the other piece is around the ability to um, really focus and drive impact. Um, and if I look at that as a key, Cascale has had a transparency program for a while, and we've kind of evolved in the last um, 18 months to really focus on two things. One, one is really focused on accountability. So transparency enables us to know what's going on and therefore be able to track and see progress and where progress is being made, but also where it's not being made. Um, but the other critical piece to that is that also then helps unlock opportunities and opportunities to drive progress, to address impact issues. Um, and if I look at that from a, an overall perspective, that's true for individual companies. They can't actually work on areas to improve and address if they don't know and see what's happening through their value chain. Um, that's true for organizations like ours because it gives us the opportunity to um, collectively aggregate and bring together and see what's happening to drive collective action and collective um, opportunities for progress. Um, but it also drives opportunities for policymakers to be able to see what's happening, where there might be issues that might need to be addressed through policy, which ultimately overall, I think that that transparency enables the opportunity for the whole industry to move forward. Um, and it's kind of why I think even before we started engaging together, we we already started working with um, with OSH, with our technology partner, Worldly, setting up an API integration so that we can get standardized, unified data exchanges. So that's kind of, to me, the key. It's really around accountability and opportunity to drive progress. So with those goals in mind, um, with the necessity you're speaking to and the, and the potential opportunities, um, what motivates you to work with us with Open Supply Hub? Apart from the fact that you're all really lovely people and we like working with <laughs> you. I mean, that's, that's a key one. But no, I actually think um, for us, um, I think one, the first point when we work in collaboration, it's always having shared, shared goals, shared vision and shared sort of theories of change. So I think we're both collectively committed to, um, to openness, we're committed to harmonization, we're committed to collaboration. And I think that shared approach is important. Uh, mm -hmm. The second piece I would say goes back to the very origins of Cascale when we began as the Sustainable Apparel Coalition. Um, and the SAC really began with a goal of harmonized approaches. So that was really, can we set, create a, a harmonized framework for collecting environmental and social data, um, with the basis that with a harmonized approach, you reduce duplication, um, you can actually compare apples with apples and like for like. And so we've always at the essence of what we do, it's always been about can we harmonize the industry? Can we come across with, you know, united approaches? Um, and when it when we looked at transparency for us, the the organization that had probably the the leading role in terms of your growth, um, the work you've done, the sectoral uh, research you've done. Uh, really for us, it was if we want to focus on 
an area that's going to drive harmonized approach to transparency. Open Supply Hub was kind of for us the obvious choice, if it, if that makes sense. And I think, so it comes back to wanting to harmonize. Um, and one of the reasons I want to talk about harmonized solutions so much is that actually it's the supply chain that has where the biggest impacts are. It's the supply chain where we, a lot of the pressure is on when it comes to decarbonization or addressing um, working conditions. And the more we can reduce the burden and reduce the duplication of work on the supply chain, the better. And transparency is one. And I mean, I was with a group of CEO um, manufacturers from a group of CEOs just in the last uh, couple of months. And one of the things they were saying is they're fatigued with different initiatives, fatigued with different mm -hmm. programs fatigued with different assessments. And so, and they were saying, I mean, I'm being very honest, they were saying, you know, please help us just bring this together. We don't wanna be putting information on 10 different platforms um, in different ways, in different formats. So I think it's very much the essence of SAC when we began, it's the essence of OSH. And so I think together we can help reduce the burden on the supply chain, identify opportunities and also release resources to focus on the impacts that we wanna achieve. Yeah, absolutely. We hear so much about this need for alignment um, yeah. and opportunities to reduce burdens across supply chain actors. With with that in mind, and, and probably that is as one piece of of, of, it, of an answer to this question, what do you see as the direction of travel for collaboration? If you're you're looking ahead um, in this new regulatory environment, um, what's 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 on your mind and what's to come? Um, I think what's on our mind is one doubling down on what we've just talked about. I think that's a really key piece. And that's why this partnership is important for us. I mean, you've got a goal of, uh, of achieving, what is it? 5 million, is it? Um, 5 mm -hmm. million uh, facilities by 2026. Um, so I think as a platform for driving that opportunity, those um, that, that accountability, but also as a platform for driving um, insights and information that we can collaborative, collaboratively work on. Uh, I think we can play a key role together with you with our unique position and our unique scope with our membership of actually driving towards that. And I think the more we can get onto the platform, um, the more we can bring that data together. I think that th this to me is, and the work we do together on with you is actually setting the foundation for, in, in, for driving intervention for driving intervention to drive improvement, to address decarbonization. And, and that then collectively, if we've, got, um, if we've got this amount of shared data, then we can actually, and the shared partners that you're already working with and the people we're working with, we can collaboratively start to actually then focus and work on where we need to improve, drive the interventions, drive the, the opportunities. Um, and the other thing I think that's gonna be important in this in, and I maybe I'll rewind a bit from my drive the opportunities and drive the interventions to with Open Supply Hub and with these collaborations, almost democratizing the supply chain. How do we ensure that the supply chain is actually a part of creating the solutions to drive those? Mm -hmm. So I think the fact that it's democratized, that it's owned um, together as an industry with the different um, multi stakeholder initiatives, the different partners we have between us, we can work together with the supply chain to actually drive create solutions to address what pretty much are some huge problems we've got when it comes to climate, when it comes to decent work. Um, so I think that's, that's for me, the, the, the way forward is we need to expand this. We need to grow it. We need to keep it democratized and we need to create the solutions together. Um, so yeah, that's, that's where I see the future, except for one very short term future piece. And that is on December the 5th, I think it is 4th. We're going to be doing a joint session together at our brand and retail forum in Brussels. So that's a short term future. Um, and he, <laughs> Love I, it. <laughs> honestly, I wouldn't get away without, my team wouldn't let me know, get away with it if I didn't advertise it. Um, but you, can, um, my... <laughs> you can hear more <laughs> that... about the opportunity we have to, to, I think, drive real change together. That's great. That's great. We got a good plug there. Um, thank you so much, Andrew. We're, we're really thrilled about this collaboration and excited to share more in the, in the coming months and, and year. Um, as we develop this partnership. I'll now turn it over to Hannah for a deeper dive into how organizations can make use of OS Hub. Hannah? Thank you so much, Natalie. Um, and as Natalie shared, there are many ways to make use of OS Hub for all different types of stakeholders. And what my colleague Bruna and I are going to do is highlight some examples to hopefully inspire you to dive deeper into our platform and data set to achieve your goals. 
And there are really three ways that we see users interacting with our data and tools. You saw this slide already. Sharing data on OS Hub, searching and layering data sets to gather uh, supply chain insights, and of course, collaboration. Um, and it's hard to do any presentation about supply chains without mentioning the legislative landscape. And so for those working on due diligence in particular, though that previous slide is sort of re reframed here into the due diligence context. So identification, risk assessment, remediation, and stakeholder engagement. You can kind of see how these map onto one another. Um, so just sharing that for those who are really focused on that kind of work. Um, and we're going to start by talking about sharing data. And as Natalie mentioned, OS Hub is collectively built, collectively used, and collectively maintained by all kinds of stakeholders. Anyone can share a data set on OS Hub for free by uploading a CSV or Excel file. So whether you're a company sharing your supplier list, a service provider sharing which locations you've collected data about, a civil society organization sharing where you're running programs, a supplier looking to share the most accurate data you can about your operations, all of that applies. Um, and we do accept and hold all tiers of supply chain data. I know that was a question from a user who um, registered today. Um, so Bruna, off to you to dive into the sharing part. So now we are going to cover some of the benefits of sharing data. So first, when you bring your data to Open Supply Hub, you are going to create like an individual ID that we call like the OSID. Second, sharing data is a tangible commitment to transparency. It shows everyone that your organization is engaged with sustainability and it's walking the talk. Being at Open Supply Hub brings visibility to our organization since several users interact monthly with the platform and we are a trusted source from transparency in supply chain. Finally, my favorite one, is the collaboration opportunities. Most organizations have internal tools to control their supply chain data, but this data is static and isolated. And when the data is in the Open Supply Hub platform, you can see how your supply chain interacts with other users, increases the possibilities of knowledge sharing and collaboration. And as we know, like challenges in supply chain cannot be tackled alone and collaborations is essential to achieve the higher results we want. And one example of how sharing data is the possibility of engaging suppliers with the Open Supply Hub platform through the claim feature. So through the claim feature, factors and owners, factor owners or manager claim, claim, claim claimer their profiles and with that add more information, such as, for example, company descriptions, minimal order quantities, contact information, and much more. Like this is so positive for suppliers because they can build trust by sharing data openly with existing and new partners. Like reduce the time they need to fill data. You can send your profile or red fill it to the, your clients. Can make it easier for stakeholders to work with you and to be found for new opportunities since they know you are already committed to transparency. And of course, increase the possibility of collaborative tracing supply chain as you're encouraging your suppliers to upload their own supply chain and discover more tiers on it. And now I will briefly share some real cases we have of partner partnerships, but you can take a look, a look later in, at your website. So the first one is the Vision Factory. So Vision Factory was looking for a transparency solution to present their commitment to sustainability. Then they discovered us. They are able not to only share data at our platform, but they also have like a map on their website. So when all the clients access their website, they can see clear where is the vision supply chain. The other one is Sunrock. Like Sunrock is a solar roof producer and was one of the first ones of the sectors to share their supply chain data at Open Supply Hub. And this generated for them like a positive recognition from internal and external stakeholders. The supply chain was opaque in the beginning when they started, but they started to see like uh, the supply chain more clear when they share and their suppliers start to share data. And nowadays, Open Supply Hub is part of their onboarding process. Thank you so much, Bruna. And so now we're gonna talk about the different ways that OS Hub enables analysis and data layering to generate insights. And one of the ways that we do that is about unlocking interoperability for supply chain data. You've heard us talk about our IDs a little bit already, but we're going to go a little deeper now. So when data is added to OS Hub, 
Each location submitted is run through our matching algorithm and then assigned a free universal ID. And as the only free open cross-sector production location ID, you can kind of think of this ID as a Rosetta Stone ID, running across all supply chain sectors and stakeholder types and allowing you to easily match, connect, and layer different data sets you might be connected to or working with. And so a couple uh, examples of these ideas in action come from the Responsible Business Alliance and Worldly, who Andrew mentioned earlier, both incorporating OSIDs into their systems to enhance interoperability and data sharing for their communities. And I'll quickly note that um, while OS Hub is a free public good, we do offer functionality available for a fee via our premium features. Um, and so if you want to automatically deduplicate your data and get OSIDs for your facilities, um, you can connect to our API. Or if you want to share a custom map on your website, we offer an embedded map feature as well. And you can find packages and pricing for those on our website. Um, so that's a little bit about how we enable research, data sharing, and, and layering and analysis via our technology. Um, and now Bruna is going to talk about how to do that directly on Open Supply Hub. Another way to use like our platform is the drawing tool that allows users to mark X specific areas on the map. As you can see from the images, you can draw custom maps on Open Supply Hub, like to gain insights into production areas and discover the stakeholders that are close to you. So here in the picture, you can see some images of examples of our team has done so far. For example, we have done like, a, we covered like the area where it happened like the earthquake in Syria and Turkey. We did like another resource that covers like the biomes areas in Brazil and how to contrast that with uh, supply chains. And we presented the water risks in Bangalore. Like all of these resources, you can explore like further in our website. And more than that, like we want to invite you to use these tools that we have to create your own maps and to develop like the impact you want to make. And now I'm going to share like an example of a partner organization that WWF is an example of the organization that uses like the data set we already had like the, for the apparel industry to overlap with the data they had in the wetlands. So this visualization made it easier for them to see and understand the patterns and advance in their research and conservation efforts. And last but certainly not least, we're going to talk about how to use Open Supply Hub to collaborate. Um, and so here are some examples of the kinds of collaborations users are currently building using Open Supply Hub. And we've said it a few times, but you can check out our tutorials and resources to learn how to search Open Supply Hub to find things like who's working with a specific facility, which stakeholders overlap most with yours or, or other partners, or who else is working in a region you care about. Um, so please do go take a look, play with the platform. Um, but I'll share a couple specific examples of, of collaboration from a few stakeholders. Um, so we have global rights compliance. They're using Open Supply Hub and our API to streamline information sharing between workers and factories and global brands they're connected to. We have the Alliance for Water Stewardship. They're using Open Supply Hub to figure out where to target their collaborations and partnerships by identifying hotspots and stakeholders connected to them. And we have companies like ASDA who are remediating grievances and conducting due diligence alongside peer brands and other organizations connected to their suppliers. Um, so lots of different types of collaboration um, being generated by different types of stakeholders. And so now that we've talked about what you have to gain, we know it's not as easy as snapping your fingers and sharing your data. Um, so Griffin is going to address some of the barriers to sharing data openly. Awesome, thank you so much, Hannah. Uh, so overcoming barriers to sharing data. Um, you should be able to have access to a poll. Um, I am watching it now. Give me one moment. All right, great. Um, so we want to hear from you. Uh, what, what are the biggest challenges and what are the biggest barriers? Um, the five that we have here, these are the most common barriers we hear about. Um, but if there are others, feel free to put them in the chat and we can address them in follow-up. Um, a lot of the barriers we hear about are from companies. So it's really geared towards that group, but also feel free to interpret uh, as it applies to you. And then Hannah, one thing quickly, um, I think, I don't know if the chat is live for all the attendees. So um, oh, if you could okay. double check that real quick, that would be great. And I will give everyone uh, 
quick 15 seconds here to go ahead and vote for the poll. The chat settings are updated and I'm gonna go ahead and close the poll. Here are the results. All right, interesting. So at first we had, let's see, 37%, navigating internal hurdles and priorities, uh, fears of antitrust, anti-competition, GDPR, privacy violations coming in second. Uh, Oh, actually, I work with so many production locations that it's overwhelming to think where to start. Uh, we're going to go address each of these individually here um, over the next few slides. So, Hannah, if you wouldn't mind, um, we can kind of go through each there. Great. So the first one, uh, overcoming internal hurdles. Uh, so, you know, with us, we always suggest loop in the right teams right from the start. Um, involve the other internal teams that are going to be involved in the decision-making process. Uh, we are always happy to get involved as early as possible. Uh, second, I would say, you know, build in deadlines, right? It's difficult to push through decisions without a timeline and a deadline that you're working towards. It really does make a big difference. Uh, and then, you know, reference our ever-growing community of reputable contributors whose legal and procurement teams have given the green light already, right? So industry leaders in various verticals use Open Supply Hub and are firm believers in what we're building. Uh, good. Next slide, please, Hannah. All right, so the next one, not wanting to invite public criticism. Um, you know, one thing, opening up really does mean that civil society organizations can reach out to you directly rather than having to resort to public criticism. Um, and then, you know, opening up really does make for more effective due diligence and provides you more information, which then leads to more informed decision-making. Um, keeping your data closed really does hinder that process. And then lastly, you know, your data is likely already out there in one way or another. Um, be in control of it, right? And, and get as many benefits from it as you can. So fears of antitrust, anti-competition, or GDPR privacy violations. Um, the data that we require to upload on OS Hub is really your basic phone book data, uh, which is really not considered proprietary. Um, and then, you know, if you have NDAs with suppliers, uh, we can help you with contract language and processes to ensure uh, that, that transparency is baked in there. Go to the next one we will lose our competitive advantage. Um, you know, in today's day and age, production locations, they're rarely a secret. Uh, a growing number of brands are acknowledging that their competitive advantage really does come from the quality of their supplier relationships. Um, and if you do have sensitive data, uh, our API service actually offers anonymous uploads. And the last one, we have so many production locations, I wouldn't know where to start. Uh, so this is common. Uh, it is an all or nothing to share data on Open Supply Hub. Uh, many contributors choose to start with simply uploading their tier one data, kind of as a solid starting point. Um, and with us, uploading data to OS Hub is straightforward. Um, and we are always here to help you um, get that up and running. Um, and then lastly, you know, leverage MSIs or organizations you're part of um, to share a specific subset of your data alongside peers and really kind of demonstrate that impact quickly. So if we reframe it here, really what we're talking about is moving from transparency from tra for transparency's sake to transparency that actually solves problems. And that is what we're doing. Um, so with that, I will uh, kick it over to Joe. Thank you so much, Griffin. So yeah, we're going to segue now from barriers into the final section of the webinar, where we're going to be looking ahead at some of our upcoming tech developments, our programs, partnerships, and hopefully how they can help our users like you overcome some of these barriers. As Hannah mentioned earlier around due diligence, OS Hub has already got a really strong technical foundation. It's ripe to support due diligence work, and we're going to be building on that over the coming year. 
to make sure that the platform really delivers maximum value and that we can continue to demonstrate the power of transparent data as a, a really robust and strong cornerstone of responsible due diligence. So this slide that you can see here is a mock-up of some of the developments that we're working on to support this. It probably will change. This is very early stage, but we wanted to give you a little bit of a flavor of what's to come. So what we can see here is a much more user-friendly interface, making it much easier to see what you can do with the data, better display information on a production location profile, and essentially make collaboration much easier. We're looking to make the process of claiming a location much easier, and we're scoping new functionality so that paid users can map deeper within their supply chains. And we're going to be introducing more insight to the data by developing data partnerships. This means that we'll be able to signpost to other really rich, exciting data sets, topics like climate, gender, forced labor, for example. Um, a little plug that we're raising for this work at the moment. So we'd love to hear from anyone that's interested in learning more or supporting this. But for now, I'm going to pass over to you, Natalie, to go into a bit more on the insights component and really excitingly introduce one of our first data partners. Thank you, Joe. Um, one of the most exciting features, I think, as Joe just mentioned, is this new insights program. A piece of feedback that we consistently get from stakeholders is that they would like to have greater visibility um, and validity verification to um, assessments, certifications, other interesting data about a facility. We have so many assessments and, and different programs that exist across the supply chain. Can we help organizations understand um, with certainty, which programs are involved with, this, with which facilities, and how can we showcase these relationships, improve data quality, build greater connections. So this is very much a mock-up, um, no screenshots, like this will, <laughs> we're definitely going to develop it further, but it does give you a sense of some of the things that we're, we're thinking about here, linking out to these other data partnerships, uh, linking out through data partnerships um, to these other platforms and programs. Um, of the highest quality um, of, of high industry standard. Um, and ultimately that this will help us support efforts towards data layering um, with other environmental and social indicator, great indicators, great programs that already exist out there. Um, and one of the first partnerships uh, that we're pursuing is with Climate Trace. Um, this is work that's funded uh, by our partners at Patrick J. McGovern Foundation. And this will bring unprecedented visibility to scope three emissions across global supply chains. Um, we're already exchanging data with Climate Trace and we'll be hosting on our site um, these emissions estimates on a per facility basis. Across the, our two organizations, this will really create the world's largest um, open scope three emissions database that we, we know of. Um, so I'm so pleased to have Leica here with us today to take a slightly deeper dive into this collaboration. Um, thank you so much for being with us, Lika. Happy to be here. So um, I'd love to dive in um, and have you give us a bit of a sense um, of what uh, Climate Trace is doing and what this partnership is looking like. Yeah. Um, first of all, a quick introduction to Climate Trace. We are a coalition, uh, a not-for-profit coalition of universities, tech startups, and nonprofits with the goal of making emissions data more accessible by providing greenhouse gas emissions data down to each facility. That means every single power plant or ship, steel production facility, et cetera. Um, um, the way we work is that each of the organizations in our coalition have focused on one emitting sector. And while we managed to cover all the major emitting sectors like cement, we found that there was this huge gap of all the smaller manufacturing sectors that when they add up, they tend to contribute to quite a large chunk of emissions like textile production. Um, and that's that's why we ended up partnering with Open Supply Hub, who had um, such an amazing data set of um, locations of, of textile production and so many other facilities. And we are now working to take all those locations and whatever information is known about those facilities and, and um, estimate emissions at those facilities and make them available both on our website and eventually hopefully integrate them on the Open Supply Hub portal as well. Great, thank you. Um, and what would you say is uh, special about this partnership? What what can our two superpowers together combine? Like, what can we do to to bring to the world? Right. So 
couple of things, right? Um, one is that both of our organizations are extremely committed to open and accessible data, which, um, you know, when you're talking about data that is so fundamental to um, decarbonization, something like knowing where a plant is and what its emissions are, um, that is the kind of data that needs to be open and accessible. And um, yeah, to just kind of put you back to you, and actually that's pre-competitive. Um, and on top of this, so many other organizations and startups can build their products on. Um, and the second thing is that we are both extremely globally focused. I think there's a recognition that when you're talking about supply chains, you can't be focused on the countries where it's easy to get data for. You know, like EU and North America tend to be much more data rich. Um, and there tends to be a lot of pro um, products that are focused on these countries as a result but most of our supply chains tend to be located outside of these regions. So even if there is imperfect data, I think this, it's so important to have a global outlook. Um, and I think that's why uh, bringing our um, respective focuses um, uh, on this issue of um, estimating emissions for all of these other manufacturing sectors is what um, makes our collaboration special. Yeah, and I, I think one of the things I'm really excited about, too, is the potential for this data layering with work that other startups and other assessments and platforms like our partner uh, Worldly, other organizations, right, are, are pursuing. This is really complementary data um, that I think drives everyone forward towards um, decarbonization. Um, would you like to give our attendees a quick little taste tour of what's to come? Yes, absolutely. Um, but before we move to the screenshot, one thing I want to mention also is that um, Climate Chase is very much a scope one project. So you might be thinking, what does that have to do with scope three? Um, well, everybody's scope one is someone else's scope three emissions. So once you mm -hmm. have a complete picture of scope one emissions, you essentially have a complete picture of scope three emissions. Um, and that's that's why we think it's so important to have emissions um, attributed down to individual facilities. Yeah, um, Hannah, if you would mind sharing the next screen. So we have um, we just launched our latest update a week ago, and we just managed to incorporate some of just a sliver of Open Supply Hub's data, just as a taster of what's to come. Um, we grabbed a few locations from um, from the textile and manu textile manufacturing um, uh, types of facilities in the Open Supply Hub database, and even within that category, we specifically focused on um, the factories that are involved in dyeing and finishing yarn preparation and fiber production specifically, because these are the three um, types of units that contribute to the most emissions within textile production. So your um, um, final assembly type of facilities don't actually contribute as much to emissions, um, which is why these industries made, a sen made sense to focus on. So um, the screen grab I have here is just of South and Southeast Asia, where you can already see these little um, manufacturing hubs um, that that become instantly visible. And um, if you don't mind sharing the next slide, um, we also have emissions estimates along with some basic metadata available, um, including um, what type of facility it is. Um, right now, um, I should mention that this is an extremely version zero type of um, data set. Um, we see this as more of a... Um, um, an MVP rather than the final product of what these emissions estimates could look like because we haven't really taken into account many of the individual facilities um, uh, uh, characteristics like the capacity of the plant, the, the type of energy source that they're using, um, et cetera, and because these are the elements that are going to come from, from our partnership going forward. Um, this was just, um, yeah, if, if, if you go look at our website, you'll see that most facilities within a country have the same emissions because we just wanted to show that it is possible and just to kind of provide that layer of data um, while we work on iterating it through, through our partnership. Yeah, great. And please, um, for all those listening, please check back in the coming months as we move this work forward. Thank you so much, Leka. Really excited about what's to come. Thank I will you. kick it Thank back so over. Much. Yeah, <laughs> I'll kick it back over to Hannah now um, to provide some additional updates for users and what's to come in 2025. Hannah? Yes. So you've heard about some higher level new features. You've heard about partnerships and collaborations coming your way. 
Um, and for those who use OS Hub now or thinking about using it next year, I wanted to dive into some very specific changes that will probably be coming your way sooner. Um, so the first one is both a mindset for thinking about our data, as well as some ways you'll see us start to organize data in OS Hub. Um, so since we are crowdsourcing data, we know there's variation in the quality of the data coming in. And the goal of crowdsourcing data is to use all those different inputs to continuously increase data quality together over time. And so a way we want to start framing that is as a funnel, um, where we start with what we're calling directory level data. So that's where a single organization has contributed a location to OS Hub, whether that's our research team adding it to the system or a stakeholder like you. And this allows us to ID that location, um, but we only have one data point to look at. So then we move to connected data. And this is where multiple stakeholders have contributed data. So we're able to begin to cross-reference and build confidence scores around the data coming in. And then finally, when the location themselves claims that profile, Bruna talked about that earlier, and adds information directly from the source. And then all these different states are layered over one another on a profile as more and more data is collected about a location. And so we share this framework with you now um, because we're going to be orienting more of our language, resources, and tools around it, from how we moderate data to how it's filtered and to how we guide you in using it as the stakeholder engagement team. So for instance, if you're looking to do heat mapping in a region more generally, maybe you're fine with all the levels of data. Um, but if you're looking for data that has multiple stakeholders that have interacted with it, maybe you want connected or just claimed data. Um, so keep an eye out for more to come on this framework in the next year. Next, um, we know that a pain point that has existed for many of you for some time is around users who just want to upload or update a single location. Um, so rather than having to create a spreadsheet for a single facility, we're introducing a workflow directly in the platform where one facility can be submitted at a time. And then if you're an owner or manager, you can also claim that location in the same workflow. Um, so we hope this will lead to a more accessible and streamlined experience for facilities and increase the number of those claimed profiles in our system. So again, keep an eye out early next year as we, we launch this new functionality. And then finally, as all these different updates, tools, and partnerships take effect, our small but very mighty nonprofit team um, wants to be able to thoughtfully integrate your data as you upload into these new systems. And that means that for at least the first six months of 2025, our processing times for new data coming into the system are going to be a little longer than they are now. Um, it doesn't mean we're always going to take the maximum number of days in the windows that you see here, but we want to set expectations and ensure you're able to build the time in you need to get the data live. Um, so we'll be sharing these new times with our community and various channels in the coming weeks. You'll have this in writing, um, and we just appreciate your support as we work to bring you the best version of OS Hub and our global data set. Um, and now I'm going to hand it back to Bruna to talk about our impact work. Thank you, Hannah. So now we are going to talk about a, a little bit of how to drive like a great year impact. So while uh, we develop our 24-26 strategy, we discuss a lot like that there is more space to drive impact with the data that is already on the platform. As you could see from the previous examples, the data already has been used for a positive impact by several stakeholders, but we want to take a, specter, a, a step further on this. The intention for the next years and the coming years is to put a more effort into our impact pillar. This pillar will bring together users around a specific program, partnerships, or for example, a report that we will develop together. We will support users using our platform to drive positive and collaborative action. You saw some of the examples of how this could work with the partnerships with Climate Trace or the multi-stakeholders initiatives before. And you can go to the next one. So, so what are the guidelines for the impact pillar? So what we are looking for in, the, in these impact programs to make sure they are aligned with your organization values. So first one, they should be data-driven. This group of stakeholders should work around the data we already have on the platform or address data sets, gaps, collaborative. As we are a pre-competitive pre organization, we have a neutral but collaborative position. So we want to maintain dialogue with several society, companies, suppliers, unions, and several other stakeholders. The position that we have allow us to bring different stakeholders with different goals, like around the same common challenge, and we want to use that. 
The project developed should be action lead, like generating tangible and concrete outcomes, such as maps, reports, or resources for crisis responses. And finally, it's very important for us that this work will be guided by users. The impact pillar is for them. We want, to, we want to make sure that those affected by the supply chain challenge are heard and that we can bring solutions together through these impact programs. And finally, like don't hesitate to reach out to us if you have any idea or if you want to partner if you are with us in the impact program, we would love to hear from you. And now Joe will talk a little bit more in detail like about your program, a program we will start to soon that is part of this impact pillar. Thank you, Bruna. Uh, really thrilled to be able to close out the webinar today with an update on our newest program. So thanks to renewed support from the Laudes Foundation, over the next couple of years, we're going to be looking at the role that open data can play in advancing just transitions within supply chains. It's really well documented that for climate transitions to be just and equitable, then buyers, brands, retailers, they all have to involve workers within the process. That needs to be done through really meaningful stakeholder engagement. And at the moment, a report that came out earlier this year from World Benchmarking Alliance indicated that fewer than 10% of companies are doing this at the moment. We know that a barrier for many is not actually knowing how to engage with worker representatives, perhaps not knowing who they are, not knowing where they are. Is there, for example, a union registered at the factory I source from? We know that OS Hub is in a really strong position to help make this data more visible so that more collaboration can happen and worker voice is a much more common tenet of due diligence. A really important part of this program is therefore going to be building out data on the platform, which is contributed by unions and civil society. We're acutely aware of the sensitivities of sharing union data. So this is going to be a purposefully really consultative process. Um, but alongside increasing the volume of union data in the platform, we're also going to be looking at tech enhancements. So how can we make that data more useful? How can it um, generate more impact? How can it make collaboration easier? And then we're also going to be profiling the data through a series of workshops and helping to build capacity so that that data can be used to really ensure meaningful stakeholder engagement. We're only a few weeks into hearing that our proposal was approved, so there's still lots to plan. But the stakeholder engagement team led by Hannah, they're going to start work on reaching out to stakeholders soon that we know have a role to play. And if this sounds of interest to you, please do get in touch. And as our current slide shows, we're recruiting. We're a uh, new team member is going to be leading on this work. So thought we'd do a cheeky plug and see if anybody here wants to share this job ad with your networks or contacts. The link is going in the chat right now. Thank you, Francesca. Um, so yeah, that's us. I think I'm passing back to Griffin now. We've got a few minutes for Q&A. Yes, thank you very much, Joe. So we do have a couple minutes here uh, with that. I know Francesca has been doing a great job of answering your questions in the chat. Um, but a couple here that I wanted to touch on live. So um, one of the questions is, is it possible to use the map or underlying data to understand the relationship, example, flow of materials between nodes in the supply chain? Um, I'll kick that question over to Natalie. Yeah, thanks, Griffin. Um, so we are not a, a traceability platform and we have no intentions of being one. There are plenty of great service providers out there um, attempting <laughs> to do that work, which is very, very difficult um, and, and our, our hats off to them. Um, but what we can do is show the relationships between facilities and, and sh show a supplier network. Um, and as Joe alluded to earlier when she was talking a little bit about some of what's to come in 2025, we do have plans to run claims campaigns, which allow um, cascading sets of suppliers to be added to the database via claims campaigns um, so that you can really have a sense of your entire supplier network. We'll be doing a lot of um, uh, user discovery and conversations with facilities and manufacturers and um, our users to make sure that we do this right, because we want to make sure incentives are aligned to ultimately uh, eliminate redundancy in, in the asks that are being made and ultimately flow the information through the ecosystem. Um, so hope that answers the question. Thanks, Griffin. Over to you. Great. Thank you, Natalie. Um, and then last question will be for Hannah. Um, we've had a question from one attendee around whether legislation demands transparency. Uh, you know, is it mandated in legislation? 
This is such a good question. And the answer is mostly no, not like in words, but what we've seen is there are these implicit needs that run underneath all of these different pieces of, of legislation that are coming out, where if you're going to do things like due diligence, if you're going to do um, deeper sort of uh, information gathering and reporting, and you're going to need to connect all of these different systems and stakeholders and service providers and tools, that is going to be so incredibly difficult if you are working in your own siloed data set by yourself. And so where we really see transparency fitting into the due diligence landscape and the legislative landscape more broadly is this sort of initial infrastructure and investment that you make in getting your data ready to meet all of these different pieces of, of legislation. There are some that, that talk about transparency specifically, but we think it's more, when we're talking about legislation, it's more of a means to an end than the, the end of the legislation in and of itself, if that makes sense. And Hannah, if I may add to that super quickly, yeah. you're, you're absolutely right. And I, I just would add that um, in order to do, do, to do proper due diligence, you have to map your supply chain. You have to know where um, your, your, your supplier base is, where your supply chains are. Um, and to do that in an open way sends a signal to regulators, um, provides information to them and show them that you're, you're serious about this work and you're willing to collaborate. So um, I think it, it is implicit. I think Hannah's absolutely right. Can I underline that and add one other thing as well, which is if even if you take the CSRD, which is the reporting and not the due diligence directive, there is actually a requirement to report on what you're doing and what you're going to do and what progress you're going to make. So it's not just about this is where I'm at. It's actually something that's very progressive thinking forward about what you're going to do. To be able to do that, you've got to demonstrate what you're doing, where you're doing it, et cetera, et cetera. So I actually think um, you're absolutely right, Hannah. It's not straightforward as the law says you must do this, but implied through it and actually you, you to, to do it successfully and to make sure you're covering yourself, <laughs> I actually think, yeah, this is important to it. Absolutely. Thanks, Andrew. Thank you, Andrew. Um, and thank you, Hannah and Natalie uh, for your responses as well. So we are right up against it with regards to time. So thank you so much for joining us today. Um, as I mentioned, we'll be sharing the recording in the deck afterwards. Um, please never hesitate to reach out to us. We're a passionate crew. We love to answer your questions. Uh, so any questions that we didn't get to, uh, we will be following up and kind of answering those in follow-up. But again, please feel free to reach out. Thank you again. And I hope everyone enjoys the rest of their days. Hi, everyone.